charged, you know, only ten dollars an hour. And I thought, like, oh, I'm never going to do that cheap drug. So you raise the prices next year. If you find that you have a nice, comfortable position where, so let's, say, let's say, Skullcap. I have a, a big market for Skullcap. So this year I do a lot of it. Fantastic. You know, some got disease, some of it's okay. And I don't have many orders. I used to always sell my Skullcap. And I said, well, I raised my prices last year. I wonder if that had anything to do with it. So I might next year lower my prices on Skullcap to see if I can get a little market share because I'd rather, I'd rather get a $50 order at $14 a pound than none at $18 a pound. <laughs> well, anyway, so the value of this price list is to show you this is what I figured out. Um, yeah, so a brief introduction to my herb business, selling about half of it's fresh, half of it's dry. Make more money on the fresh than you do on the dry. I love fresh orders. I love dry orders, but I love fresh orders more. <laughs> so, but that's a rarer market. But it gives you an idea of the prices. I also sell seed from my earth plants. I sell propagation material from them. And I make tinctures and herbal infused oils. And so I have, and I do educational things in my gardens. And I, if I had a good educational manager, I could really up my income. Uh, just by doing workshops on how to grow plants. Because I have some fantastic herb gardens. Which, uh, but, so there's, in other words, there's like seven income streams, you might say, for my operation. There's the wild crafted and the, and the cultivated. So, a permaculture approach. Whenever you, any piece of land that you do a design for, you do a really thorough species analysis. So I, 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 one of the things I specialize in is going to a piece of property in the northwest, and I can identify most of the plants on the site and then go off and probably find out about the ones that are missing. So uh, we make a list of all the plants on site and then all the plant communities on site. Is there a riparian cottonwood habitat? Is there a bunch of grass habitat or a sagebrush or whatever? All the habitats are down there. And then what grows in each habitat is really, so, in other words, how much balsam root on your land? Oh well, yeah, well, it isn't just good enough to get us a species list. It's sort of like also, you're ranking the biomass, basically, of, of the different things. You could probably do it by biomass. You know, one percent, you know, five percent of the biomass of this ecosystem is cottonwood, but only point, you know, one percent is horsetail, but the horsetail might give you more income than the cottonwood. They need, uh, so then you look at the income potential from all of the current existing weeds and plants there. What are the wild crafting potentials? Now that's permaculture. Because the closer you can get to a hunter gatherer, the less time you have to invest in your product. God grew those plants for me out there to wild craft and got us. And I'm just so thankful when I go out there that I work really hard to grow plants. It takes a lot of my time and energy. You have to baby them a lot of them. But the ones out there are just doing perfectly fine all on their own. All you have to do is harvest them. So that's it's always uh, one of the things is to assess the resources on each site. And then you, you can also assess the resources in the neighborhood and assess the resources within the greater driving range. So basically you have different levels of wild crafting as you go out. Uh, and so you can assess all that. But then you might say on this property, it's like, well, there ain't any plants that are worth money right now. They're mostly, some of them are things we don't want and we can't sell. How do we turn them to our advantage? They're all going to be useful to us. But how do we do enrichment plantings? And that's a term used for when you have an ecosystem and you're adding in new species, you're enriching the ecosystem. And they can be native or non-native. And so as a form of restoration, you would be doing, so a form of, of this permaculture approach to herbs is to do ecosystem restoration with medicinal plants that will give you further wild crafting products down the line. Some things yield really quickly within the, in the first year. Some things take two, three, four, ten, and on. But the sooner you get them going, in a couple of generations, if you just plant everything out that's going to make that site really juicy and 
the second generation, by the second generation, it's a piece of cake. When I was in Nepal, I saw the results of 500 years of human occupancy on single pieces of land, where they had picked up all the rocks and arranged them in giant rock walls and little giant rock steps or highways that basically paved, you know, stone ways that dropped down with the topography, and it was. And they had stone houses. The amount of stonework in the, in, the, in, 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 the, in the ecosystem was just certainly the most staggering I've ever seen. So, um, why did I get onto that? Uh, the impact of 500 years of being oh, in the place. If you have, if, in only 50, 20, 50 years of starting these kinds of herbal, herbal, I call them herbal food forests, by establishing things like that. And the next generation or two down the line, it gets really easy. If you build really nice houses that are going to last for 10 generations, you've got the next 10 generations covered. You know, and so you're working a lot up front for a lot of payback for the future and for the future inhabitants. And in our, you know, get what you can society, that's not really encouraged, though. But permaculture is about leaving a legacy. And part of the legacy is the herbal products, part of the ecosystem. So another, another, and I have a whole, whole lecture on the establishment techniques for that. Uh, herbal scaping is a term I use for using, instead of edible landscaping, you're using herbal scaping because you are, you are making the landscape beautiful and ornamental for the clients and so they can still live in suburbia, but unknowns to their neighbors, that's all useful stuff. <laughs> Whoa. You know, not like... All the people that have useless stuff in the neighborhood, none of their plants are worth anything as far as like medicine or food, they're just for the looking. They, they get, they get, some of them get a little irate if you grow things that aren't just worthless. Sort of like, you know, puff, what do they think they are? Growing useful plants. Um, but herbal scaping is looking for those people that actually want to incorporate, incorporate medicinal herbs. You can set up a partnership with a clinical herbalist that will interview the family make a list of the herbs that is best suited for their family, and the permaculture designer designs it into their landscape in a permacultural way, with all the other considerations, and so that they are surrounded by their own medicine that they can pick, they can enjoy, they can be part of the life of. And it's much strong. If you grow the hawthorn tree and you pick the hawthorn flower and you make the hawthorn medicine, that's gonna be stronger than the medicine that you bought from someone that do it right next door. Magical element. So that's herbal scaping, but you can also apply that to fragrance scaping. It's like a sideline because you design the landscape to be fragrant throughout the all year, all seasons. There's always something fragrant in the landscape. It's relatively easy to do because there's lavender and rosemary is kind of tender for most of us here, but lavender is a little tender. But there's a lot of clary sage is a great biennial, but there's tons of fragrant plants that you can, medicinal fragrant plants that you can have in the landscape. And in the winter you have things that have fragrant foliage or fragrant, like con some conifers, and also fragrant barks, like spice bush. There are, there are barks that are fragrant, so you might have to do a little bark scraping to get the fragrance, but there's always fragrance available, as well as color, as well as herbs, as well as food, as, in as much as possible. Also, a many, there's a big change between the attitude of what is a food and what is a medicine. We used to keep them separate, but we now know there's a huge class of things that are in between, you might say, that are, these are really gnarly medicines, these are really benign foods, but there's a lot of, especially through the spices, pretty much every spice you can name is an excellent medicinal plant. So just <coughs> adding the right spices to people's diets, you could do a spice recipe diet for every chronic illness that there is. These are spices and foods that will help the condition of this particular kind of patient, whatever it may be. So clinical herbalist teaming up with permaculture. The let your food be your medicine. I talked to a German woman recently at one of my workshops and I said the same thing. I was out of great new perspective. We had that third, that's food and medicine, she turned to me and she said, huh. she said, what do you know? She says, all foods are medicines. Oh my God, I jumped back. She really said it forcefully, all foods are medicines. I'm like, huh, that's a, that's a deeper perspective perhaps. 
but there is any right, there's a continuum of the effectiveness or the strength of the different foods. Uh, another thing is to put design your functional needs of in the ecosystem with the medicinal plants. So let's say you want a lot of insectary plants, which we usually do. Uh, we want a lot of pollinator things that feed pollinators because we want to have honeybees. We want to have habitat for, for insect eating birds. How do we create that best? We need shade in certain places. We need a riparian corridor, trees and shrubs to filter the water that's coming through the subsoil to make sure all the nutrients are sucked up. Um, when we need those functions met, when we design the plants that will meet the functions, you can just substitute them and just, you know, put in a medicinal plant and do the same thing. It has multiple uses of that. You know, if you have a food that feeds the bees and provides habitat as, and uh, provides food and is a medicine and is fragrant and is beautiful, you know, now we really have now we're really cooking. The more uses you can pile on, the, higher, the more uses you get, the higher you can rank it. But then there's things like Lily of the Valley that may not sell much, but the smell reminds me of my childhood and my mother. And so sniffing Lily of the Valley for me is therapeutic and helps take me, you know, helps me connect with my path. So I'm going to plant that for no other reason. It's also it's very fragrant. It's beautiful, and um, and it, it, it triggers memories. So you could actually make up a, it would be interesting to have a fragrance memory expert person that goes around and helps people to find out what the fragrances are for them that will, you know, be good for them. It may be good for treating Alzheimer's. Yeah, it might yes, be. it would, it wouldn't bring it? Back the, yeah. yeah, so they say playing the old music. Yeah, instance. they're just focused on <laughs> Yeah, well, let's get it together, folks. Okay. Um, Another, so the next level up is as a cash crop, and that's what I do. I have rows, I don't have any pictures, you know, you can go look at this guy's book, The Organic Medicinal Herb Farmer. This is the best U.S. book on the topic of organic medicinal herb growing, or herb growing in general. And uh, there's lots of pictures in, uh, in here, we we'll pick herbs in rows. So that's what I do, to some extent, is herbs in rows. But my rows are relatively short, and there's next things to them, next things next to them that are pressing in upon them of other species. And so, you, uh, in my this year, I have a hundred species in my new plant. Anyway, I'm just you know, hundred species is pretty good, and ninety percent of them are doing well, and ten percent have had problems. Um, but it's a it's. On a quarter acre, so that's a hundred species per quarter acre, that's hard to call it monoculture. He has a whole row of horseradish. Take away his permaculture license. <laughs> 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 no, it's just only one row. But anyway, you know, permaculture can work at all scales. We shouldn't scoff at, you know, 40 acre permaculture farmers that are doing a 40 acre per You know, that would be kind of stretching it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's room for broad acre permaculture as well broad acre permaculture, but I'm still doing small-scale polycultures, and um, if you're ever in Port Townsend, you, know, you can see if I'm doing a, a tour or something, occasionally I do it. Done a long ways away. Um, another category is what I call the botanical garden uh, approach herb growing where you really you're not out to, your main goal isn't to make money though it should always be a site it should always be there uh, the main goal is to establish uh, there's a really wide diversity of plant species just because you're trying to in a sense be <coughs> an arc uh, for that species you just want some species have many arcs St. John's wort is vast swaths of the United States of the western United States um, but there are some plants that are endangered. And now, now if we go into native plants, if, we, if I went to the, the regional overlook for rare, endangered, and threatened plants of the inland northwest, I would get a list of plants and I could say, oh look, 20 of them are really likely to be herbal. I mean, there's, there's, you could just be trying to save plants, but 
you could pick those herbal ones and get get some seeds somehow and some starts and actually start growing them and have a little arc for that you know that species and then you collect the seed and get propagation material and help other people to grow it so that its numbers grow you're assisting that species to stay alive and to propagate in more places and if there's ever a time when they wanted let's say these hills here have been pretty much all overgrazed at, at some point in the past, some more than others. But it's all been it's all been altered pretty much. You know, it's very it's to some extent or another. And to do restoration on the bottom and walk that at some point is gonna need a lot of seed. So if we have, you know, fifty local people with small little you know, herbal arcs at their place, they can pull that uh, genetic material and you can start getting the, the kind of needs that you have for doing larger scale restoration. Once we have the permaculture presidential candidate in office, there'll be a, mo a lot of money let loose oh, yeah. to, for late local native <laughs> seeds. <Yeah. laughs> um, so those are the, the ways I could think of off the top of my head of how permaculture fits traditional plants into ecosystems. So what have I missed? What, you know, or ramifications or check. Yes, um, well, I mean, I'm curious about markets for medicinal herbs. Mushrooms. <coughs> markets. 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 So how? I mean, I know I know how you've been connected for 20 years, but I mean, for someone starting out, finding good markets for the kind of herbs for those kind of herbs. Yeah. Yeah. Can I piggyback into that? It's like, how do you compete with Pacific Botanicals and Herb Farm and? like these other companies that are selling at Whole Foods and get a smaller slice of that market that they've got. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just say, this is more of a comment, but I buy herbs fresh and dried and often it's really hard to get them locally near Missoula. I have to go through Pacific Botanicals if I want fresh or often an herb farm and I don't want to go that far. I want something that's in my state or closer. Uh -huh. Who are you local. buying for? Uh, myself. Oh, okay. You have <laughs> I a mean, small like, little herb yeah, business. exactly. Oh, okay. Susan. Nope. Um, well, so there's a little teeny peek at the answer to that. The answer is that it's not easy, basically. Um, here's a case in point. She's a small buyer that wants small amounts of things, probably one to five pound amounts, of uh, fresh and dried. And she can't find enough herbal uh, growers here. So one of, one of the things I'm in the process of uh, helping instrument to arise is an herbal marketing co-op for Northwest Washington. That's being grandiose, but it's a bunch of you know people around Jefferson County, Port Townsend to start with. But you know our goal is to have an herbal marketing co-op with a central office when and everybody that's part of the co-op, let's say it's uh, 15, there's a lot of interest, 25 people to start with. They all write down what they have and and what they want and turn it into the secretary who then makes the general price list for for the for the and, and then tries to help those people market that stuff. And they do things called market amalgamation. There's an order for a hundred pounds of oat straw, but all these little players don't have you know, I had this year I produced about, you know, sixty pounds of oat straw and I had hundreds of pounds on the vine that we could never had room to dry it. It's real easy to overgrow oats. Um, but if we had a hundred pound order and somebody else had 50, two fifties all of a sudden add up or two tens could make a hundred pound order. So any amalgamation, smaller people can fill bigger orders. So there's possibly one example. And there's a place, an example of that is the Sonoma County Herb Exchange which is specifically for all the growers and all the buyers in Sonoma County. So it's a big herbal county. So this is a real happening thing, but they standardize the prices so that all the buyers go there and that everybody's motherwort is the same price. Everybody, you know, it isn't like, you know what 10 people's motherwort prices are. We have this one motherwort price. Uh, so that's two little bit different ways of going about it. I was just, just going to comment that... Um, I know for myself, I wouldn't be able to sell in Eastern Washington. I had to figure out a way to market to people and meet them where they were at. And so uh, it's why I, I don't sell just bulk herbs. I make a lot of blends that are really self-explanatory to people because I find that um, a lot of people don't 
know what even a tincture is or really it's an, a, a big process of education in rural places but also you have so much more benefit that people are really excited about so I think that some of it is like meeting people where they're at and value added it to make them yeah and so I have an example like I work at a wine company and weekends I waitress there but the people that I work for are like really into what I do but so what I, I have all these medicinal teas that I sell at market and of course I'm not I like go home and say oh I have this nutritive tonic tea and I put it out and people like they all come in on their boats or whatever that like I don't care about and I've tried to like vend in that area like rurally and it's like uh, yeah people are just think I'm a weirdo so then I started changing my names of like these like tonic things and um people started tasting it and so they're like d d getting the stuff that, so, and now people are starting to be like wait what are you doing so now it's like I have to I have to like educate people and I have to meet them where they're at and I have to fish for them but it's also patience because like so that yeah. so that would be value added direct marketing so you if you turn all your herb growing stuff into value added products and sell it retail at farmers markets it wouldn't take much ground at all to make a living. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to sell wholesale in large amounts, well then it takes a, a much bigger. So the more closer to the, to the market you are, the better. Uh, Herbal CSAs is another model. There's, you know, there are not many out there yet, but they're starting to happen. You know, Herbal CSA, we get herbal products over time. It's hard to break into the store co-op market where they have all the jars on the shelves, butterfly herbs, and, uh, uh, you know, any, any main herb store and co-op natural food market, they'll have a lot of herbs and jars, metal cool. sweet, and so um, as I found it very hard to break into that market when we had a little bit of success. And I would go to an herb store with bins of my best herbs, all neatly packaged and labels, and I would go into the store and find the, the owner and say, I just brought this bin of herbs to show you, look at my calendula next to the stuff in your jar, look at my hyssop compared to the stuff in your jar, look at my motherwort compared to the stuff in your jar, look at my red clover compared to, look at my, same. and and they and I would say, you know, obviously my stuff is, very, is of higher quality, and in almost every case it would be, and would you buy my stuff? And, uh, and I said, well, I really want your business. I, whatever you're paying now, I'll take that. You know, it isn't like I'm setting, uh, I will match whatever price you're, if it's Pacific Botanicals, Mountain Rose, San Francisco Herbs, Frontier Herbs, if I'm matching their price, I might say something like, <coughs> uh, you, but yeah, you may save on, they may save on shipping charges. Here's a case in point. Uh, this is for a local buyer that you could, but this again, it's rare to find this market. I have a lot of people that buy herbs for me around the United States, not lots, a few companies, and a couple dozen, and somewhere in Washington, New Jersey, for instance, and they, I just shipped them a uh, nine pound bale of blessed thistle. You know, so we compress it as much as we could, but it cost $80 to ship it there. So. They might have been able to find it cheaper somewhere else. Maybe I was the cheapest price. But all of a sudden they had to swallow an $80 shipping bill. It almost doubled the cost of the material. Whereas, or a third. So here's, and that's dry. So if there's somebody growing blessed thistle two blocks away or a mile down the road and they can deliver it and collect that $80 delivery charge, they can charge a lot more. You can compete on that delivery charge as you say. Delivery <coughs> charges are getting higher and higher. I have fresh market for herb buyers that ship stuff to New Jersey and Arizona. It will double the cost of their product. You know, if I put a 50-pound box in the mail, it's going to cost you know it's worth $500. It's going to cost them another $500 to get it overnight. So it's incredible the cost that these fresh market people will pay. So if you can find fresh market people in your neighborhood and say, if you're shipping anything from far away and paying those horrible shipping costs, we'll produce it locally and we'll save you money on the shipping cost. So there's a tack I think that would really work. But unfortunately, there's not that many product makers using fresh material. We need more of them. The whole society needs rearranging. So right now we're operating at a disadvantage. The FDA laws on value-added processing 
you know, drying, commercial drying, uh, commercial kitchens, retail sales, wholesale sales. There's just so many barriers, impediments, and legalities, and uh, fees that it really makes it difficult <coughs> for the herbal community. So we're suffering actually under right now under persecution. Um, we are being persecuted, and so you say, how do? You, what's the market? The market is being persecuted. And so that makes it more difficult, but it's, it's growing nonetheless. Um, has there ever been a, I don't know, Max, Max Gerson, you know, your son, Gerson, um, cancer treatment, you know, he's got farms everywhere. Gerson? Gerson, Max Gerson, G-E-R, you know who we um, yeah, about, right? right? Okay, so um, wouldn't there be an opportunity to make healing centers throughout the United States that would be more herbally based? I mean, get a person like you to like what they want and then get an herbalist to actually plant it there at the AMA center and then create the Huh? The AMA might make your life miserable if you tried to do that. <laughs> well, I'm sure they made, they did yeah. make his life miserable, but I would think that um, like bed and breakfasts, you could just say a healing spot. There are yeah. there are there these are things places. out there, and they are possible. Um, again, there's going to be you know bonds, insurance, well, you know, you know, and certain kinds of housing accommodation rules and restrictions, and blah blah blah. Just, but there are more. There are a lot of spas and, and various kinds of healing retreat centers mm -hmm. in, in the in the U.S. And there should be, as you say, one in every town. one in every town. Yeah. Like in San Diego, one girl from San Diego is at the health institute, which is based on Edward Morris work, and uh, um, so she. And then Hippocrates. Hippocrates, yeah. It's called Optimum. Optimum Health Institute. So the one girl from Southern California, and then Hippocrates is another one. A certain amount moved to Mexico, so there are certain uh, certain ones, uh, Hoxie and various other ones operating out of Mexico. Yeah. Now. But people have great success. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They're, they're very successful. Yeah. And, um, well, the Gerson one is in Mexico. Huh? The Gerson. It is. is it is. I just think that with the type of meth and, and alcoholism on the reservation, it's a no-brainer to build something. Oh. Either here in Boston or somewhere, as an example. And I know that from substitute teaching with all the kids that are tribal that want to do something, they're wanting to do it. They've asked even the little elders if they could create something like this. It seems like there should be... And so what are they actually asking for? They're asking to create a healthy... Well, first off, they want to grow pot. They want to do it because, <laughs> <laughs> because of the meth and everything else, okay? And the alcoholism. Well, that's safer. It is safer. Exactly. And then they want to grow the herbs, and they want to do it within their own reservation, and they want to do it for their people, and they don't want to do the medical AMA thing because they're all dying from it anyway. Can you know? The young kids are not wanting to go that route. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's hard in Montana. Like, it's easier. So you can practice as a naturopath or an acupuncturist in Montana, but then, like, if you're a nutritionist or an herbalist, it's really hard uh, if you don't have the right um, certifications to practice. So like Oregon and Washington, for example, and this is like my background, so much easier, but Montana, a little bit more difficult. But if you had a, like a naturopathic doctor on board, I think it would be Well, th that's what I'm saying. Easier. You could, you could uh, pony up with a person who already had a farm who was willing to grow the things that you wanted, get a naturopath, do that thing. I don't know. I started a bed and breakfast. I say it's a healing spot and it goes because it is healing. But I'm not a doctor. But someone else who uh, maybe had a little, like say you had a little tiny home, 200 square feet, 300 square feet, and it didn't cost you hardly anything. You could have it at a place, a person's place. And then it's paid for. You're doing a benefit. They need you there. It's on a place that already needs you. So it's like a guided uh, huh? retreat, a guided healing retreat experience. One, you're getting your medicinal needs met because right. you're getting the product you want. Is this still there? Two, um, well, is this your drone? <laughs> <laughs> Two, you're doing a benefit for the people already here, and you don't need the um, you don't need the, the the political stuff. What are you doing? I imagine you do that on like an existing organic or sustainable. Yeah, like the infrastructure, I, mean, I think, is If you're there. doing it 
for the Native Americans, you let you should let them be the ones who are initiating this. I, I think. Well, thought. I'm not doing they, it at I, all. What I'm saying is that um, they're a nation within their own nation, so some of the stuff can be done by them, for them, and then they. I think that, they I think that um, the collective thinking has, and the act of the AMA within their within the system, mm -hmm. is making it really difficult for, to initiate that. Because I've been doing substitute teaching now for 20 years, and I know these kids are now adults, and they're not getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just saying I don't want to be that. But it sure, but since I have a farm, it should be nice to let it maybe have them come do that. I got a place now, you tag your it. <laughs> so that's it. I don't know. So, there are so many kinds of medicinal herb or, or healing spas needed. I mean, there would be a proliferation with, with all kinds of different angles on it. There, there's so many. Mm -hmm. But uh, a medicinal herb, I've always wanted to be part of a medicinal herb and medicinal fruit cooperative <laughs> community that we had retreat centers and healing centers, educational centers, outreach, uh, information going out, trainings, and the place would just be this lively hub of people humming in and out and people getting getting uh, getting some healing help. Medicinal lifestyle. Yeah, there's it's just it's, it's, it's a there's multifaceted yeah. uh, horticultural so anyway, but there's so that's a long term thing. Some people heal quicker than others, some people don't heal and some people die and so but by using the best that we know now know we can we can beat the current health system hands down, no problem. I mean our herbal and natural healing community is just heads and shoulders above uh, the current system. Um, but again, as I said, it's being it is being persecuted. It is it is difficult. So we should you know sort of press at, press back at the system and do as much as we can and uh, keep moving forward and uh, and you know, there may be a break in the political situation sometime where that things will ease up, where all of a sudden swing in our favor and really try to, and people love herbalists and small scale farmers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think most people now would say that they actually think that small scale farmers are a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, so, what's our time frame now? We were supposed to go from 3.45 to 5.15. I'm just kind of curious where we're at time wise. Yeah, well, we have a long time yet. Um, so we, there's a lot of different avenues we can go down, but there, let's first just see what else is, you know, is there any questions bubbling up or yeah. comments? How did your approach change in Port Townsend versus like Tenasket or here or other places you've been since it's a pretty different ecosystem out there? Very, very little, very little. So you're I, it's hard the, to the same types of plants? plants? We're doing the same thing, <laughs> but go ahead. No, like different plant composition. Well, I'm using different species, of yeah. course. I mean, I'm using 90% of the same species. Everything I grew here, I grow there. Okay. And I've added some new ones because they were they were too tender for here. So I've my palate has changed a bit. But uh, so it, but it, I'm still using a lot of the same old standbys. You know, I a lot of berries. A lot of currants, a lot of loose berries, a lot of aronia berries, and I would say this: that I don't think there is such a thing as a non-medicinal berry. Mm -hmm. You know, that won't have a noticeable physiological effect. I mean, blueberries are, especially the wild blueberries. I've been told, but I think all all the uh, blueberry family is incredibly healthy for our bodies and brains, and it's a great detoxifier. I mean, that is a Really serious medicine, aronia berry. You know, if you take some, you know, and hawthorn berry. Look at hawthorn berry and its effect on the whole heart and cardiological system. God, you know, so uh, all the ber I like to put a lot of berries and fruits in my system that have medicinal uses, and I also like bark. So I also put in things like I love a cork tree in the system, and, and there I could put plant polonia. I had planted polonia in Montana, but. I knew it would die back to the ground most years, but there I can get it into a tree. Uh, but 
so the species are similar. The composition is very similar um, in terms of like how I stack systems. You know, what I generally tend, generally tend to do is put, um, I have rows on three foot centers just going across the field. And uh, sometimes there's curving lines in there, but not very often. If there's a woman in my life, sometimes she makes me put curves in. <laughs> See, I just do these three foot straight lines down the field. And uh, a, t a typical combo would be uh, a row of raspberries here and a row of, well, let's make it currants and, and, and gooseberries or, you know, ribes. And it's marching off down there. And it's like in this row in between is going to be a two year root crop like Ella Campaign. And so, and in between the currents in that first year, I'm going to put, uh, uh, let's say, I might, if it's really going to be short term, something like a basil or a summer savory or an annual, you know, an annual herb, calendula, I put a lot, but they're just too dominating, unless you have a real strong growing thing. But you put something, and sometimes beans, but just for food plants. But in between, so I have this, so year one, I get, I don't get any currents of gooseberries really there. So but I get all the income from that, that annual crop that grew between them. And the Alec campaign in the meantime just made me a seed crop and I sold the seed, if I have a seed buyer, and I do. Then, uh, but the second year I get currants and gooseberries. And I don't, that annual crop, I, I might even put a biennial crop in there, depending on the spacing, but I may not have any crop there, but the second year I get that big root crop. And then I have an empty spaceship, but by then the root, the, the, the current roots are all the way to the middle of the row and the canopy and so now it's just the walkway so you, you know I'm timing you know uh, timing it in and then trees might be every now and then within the cotton within, within the current row possibly sometimes I do you know <coughs> ginkgo tree two currents ginkgo every you know, eight feet then there's another ginkgo tree then two currents and then the ginkgo tree and two currents and in between the the uh, I put bee balm in between the currents, which is kind of a little bit biggish, but uh, you, you appropriate sized uh, perennial herb or short-term perennial herb in between the, the currents. Uh, so I have, you know, the long-term ginkgo crop, I've got the short, you know, I've got all, you know, something coming in every year. So I design my system so that there's really good income in year one and good income every year thereafter. Now that's my that's my goal I look from as, as, as my farmer. That's my farm goal is that I'm going to make money the first year. In other words, pay all my expenses and make a little bit. And the second year, my establishment costs are pretty much over. And then, and then next year, I have a very lot less cost and maybe as much income. But now I have a much bigger percentile, percentile, percentile in the second year. And then after that, the, 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 the income sort of tapers off. <coughs> uh, okay, so that was two thoughts on that. What did I do different? Not too much, following on the same track. One of the things I'm wanting to do, I have a person that's working on it with me, a agroforestry <coughs> documentary, a, do a documentary of, of my agroforestry plantings, which has mainly been focused on herbs and some on, and, and, on food and or food and medicine generally are both. <clears throat> and if you go to my website, I have 19 YouTubes all lined up from eight different, I think eight different locations that I farmed at. And you can look at all my different systems and see how they put rhyme or reason on them. You know, it's just that they're all complex, complex systems. And uh, I'll be going on length there. But anyway, I hope to get a documentary together because it's really good cool stuff. Have you gotten a good ginkgo crop uh, no, no, planted? No, uh, you know, this current system is only in two years. My one, I have a five, something that's been up here for five years and it's been decimated by grasshoppers. Ravaged, you know, like pretty much destroyed by grasshoppers for three years in a row. <coughs> so, it ain't looking very good. Right you now. sell grasshoppers. We <laughs> sell grasshoppers. If they come back again them. next year, <laughs> every year they, you know, anyway, so Nature is really, it's really making it difficult. Farming is a, some, somebody asked me at the bar the other day, and they said, uh, you gamble? I said, 
I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a farmer. And everybody, everybody said, oh, yeah, yeah, we all know that. Yeah, and, you know, farming is gambling. You just don't know what the weather's going to do. You can get hail or any up and running. You know, you, you never know what's going to show up in the growing season. All of a sudden, the plague of grasshoppers come in. You're going to have the best year ever. And it's like, oh, it's, it's just a marvel. And then you should sell chocolate covered grasshoppers. No, what I really needed is, is the time, is the lifestyle to have a lot of turkeys, grasshoppers, yeah. or chickens, and guinea hens. Yes. And there should be a huge amount of them up there in a giant moat. But I don't have the lifestyle time and the personnel to run a poultry operation in a good way, you know. It just, you know, anyway, so it takes, you have to be there. Someone's got to be there every day of the year, or you can maybe get a, you know, for poultry, you got to be there. And that's, that's, anyway, it could be done, and but it's, nature can be difficult. Nature can just wipe out your crop. Or take give you a fifty percent loss, and you never know. There's, um, that's why farming is gambling. It works most times. Uh, I've only been, well, yeah, it works most times. It works. Uh, it works. It works fine. Permaculture works great. I mean, my planting it isn't like. That's the only time I've ever been really like wiped out. This grasshoppers here. And they ask me if I want to move back to hot springs, and I'm like, no. Well, there's some things I really like about hot springs. But that's really, that really, it's hard. Difficult. Um, where else? Should, you know, I'm, just, I'm just going to meander around if you don't give me a Do you ever try? Um, what are your thoughts on sassafras being banned by the FDA? I'm sorry. Oh, sassafras being banned by the FDA. The, the FDA is going after herbs, various herbs at different times and make different attacks. Comfrey, they really attack uh, kava, and uh, you know there's a lot of the low dose botanicals they really frown on. Uh, but sassafras, there's another, and I heard that they're about to break the crack uh, down on bone set. Have you heard that? On what? Bone set, Euphorium uh, purpolliata. Anyway, that's news to me, but someone just told me that the other day. Hmm. Uh, uh, so what's the question again? So what are your thoughts? Like, is there on sassafras? On okay, so. Oh, is there a way to get a change? I'm Just sure. Do but it. Is, how to do that is, you know. <laughs> Just do it. Going to. Tell, why do you even. Because I'm making herbal root beer and I can't sell it because it's. That's fast. That's fast. You know. My dad used to make it. That is good. Dairy fries. Me. I'm sorry, but the root beer is corn. I know. Not She's not making that. the real know, right? the real <laughs> stuff, and I mean that's what people drink in the it's, 30s, 40s. It's and worth the, like looking into the urban moonshine story to like have a good idea of what can happen to you um, as far as like dealing with issues like that. Yeah, I that would be. We need to. There are evil organizations that help with good advice on things like that. You know what? I bet they're not free. Yeah. Um, the illegal route, just do it anyway, and just be. You know, I, I do things on a low key level where I'm just dealing with local public. But as soon as you put it on a store shelves with your name and your label and the ingredient list, and you put sassafras on there, you are obviously opening yourself up to be having your hands spanked or worse. Or, or worse. Um, that and so it's a risk that a lot of people wouldn't want to take. So uh, in fact, most people I think, the most sensible people right now would say, "Oh, I just keep my head low and maybe sell a bit some special lots to my friends." Uh, it would be, it would be. Uh, I was just at the the uh, University of Washington Arboretum this spring, strolling around with my friend, tree friend expert uh, Arthur Lee Jacobson, and. He pointed out the stand of sassafras, and they had runners, rip runners coming out yes, thick, man. There was just like, I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I said, ah, as a plant propagation person, I see here that there's a lot of young sassafras trees that would be really easy to just separate from your, you know, like there's like, there's a hundred young sassafras trees around that stand. So if I would get some sassafras plants, and get them in the ground and, and take care of them really good. Yeah. Once they start making runners, and and pretty soon 
you'll have a nice little sassafras plantation. And right about then, the presidential platform will really kick in. <laughs> and you'll be sitting on all the yeah. sassafras. <laughs> and, and you don't need to pay that expensive shipping for the East Coast. Yeah. So that's one thing I would think of doing. Because yeah. just establishing, establishing the relationship and using it press all of a sudden will give you a, you know, sort of new insights. And again, there's always that local market. My dad used to make real root beer, too. Um, but the other is another tack to take. What are the analogs mm. to sassafras? In other words, what are the roots that can be used, or herbs that can be used in a root beer that will give you the same kind of effect, both pharmacologically and or taste, and especially, especially after the taste, uh, pharmacology began. Um, but that would be, that would be if getting both would be good in your analog. So the three herbs I think that are made of root beer here are sass, sarsaparilla, a rally in the colors, pincus pine or, or pipsisua, chemophila, a lot of, and um, wild ginger, asara. Do you use all those? Um, I have wild ginger. I don't, but I have wild ginger, but I know I have not Anyway, those, those are three things I know have been used in old-time root beer remedies. But I'm sure if you research, yeah, you may have done all this research, what are all the things that have been used in old-fashioned root beers in the past? And what do you have access to and experiment with? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want to try your product. <laughs> <laughs> have you tried it without the sassafras? No, I haven't. But I just was wondering um, if there, what the lifespan of sassafras would be of getting like, not banned. If they were to lift the ban, because it was a study done like in the 1960s or something. They, they, they it's sort of like, it's almost like the political establishment that establishes their reasons to go to war somewhere. It's all pretty much, you know, just pulled out of thin air, uh, or they, in a few studies that they, it's, there's, it's, what is it? Someone said, you can find a scientific study to to support whatever you want to, you know. There's, you know, there's, there's, you can pick and choose your scientific studies. Sassafras in undue amounts can injure certain people that have certain constitutions. I don't know if it's liver would be my suspicion, but that, that, that you can take too much sassafras. It's true. But the amount that you, that there's a the therapeutic use of it, uh, of, of moderate amounts of it, is, is better than not taking it. In other words, it's, it's useful to take it. You can take, some people can take too much. So, uh, sassafras root beer, I don't think so. I don't think. Uh, for one thing, it's going to be expensive. If, if you go to the health food stores and you buy that burdock drink now and that dandelion drink, those little yeah. soda, those little soda things, uh, root, yeah. true root beers, well, those are spendy, spendy little buggers. <laughs> so um, and tasty. So if you can make a really good product, you know, people will pay good prices, obviously. But you need, you know, a really good product that's really healthful and tasty. I read that you can buy saffron because it's the saffron that that they made illegal. Uh -huh. So you can buy sassafras that has the saffron removed. Oh, well, but might be best like, like what I you need. Know. Yeah, I, well, give it a try. I, you know, it's like maybe they get the flavor and not the therapeutic effect. I, so I don't know. Yeah, really. that but I would try it. So that you know, sounds, sounds great. Darn FDA. I know. <laughs> um, so we need, we need there's, a, out, there's a movement, a movement, it's not a movement, it's an idea that has just, it has just started in, in Portland, Oregon, they have a recoding office in the city government uh, that works with citizen activists to change laws and codes to make it more sensible for the general public. Wow, what a novel idea. City government that's trying to make things easier and make the laws easier for people to have outdoor toilets or gray water systems or cob buildings or natural <coughs> health or Chicken sassafras the in their root beer or whatever. <laughs> So we need recoding outfits at the highest levels of government. Mm -hmm. We need a permaculture president. We'll put that on the permaculture presidential platform. PPP recode, recoding uh, uh, new secretary of recoding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so it's nice to be with a group of people that are all interested in herbs. And uh, we have a lot of things in common and uh, a lot of things to share. How many of you are coming to the Montana Herb Gathering? Yeah. 
good. talk a little bit about uh, how I get really good results and really good yields and good profits in the first year. Um, I, I would advise doing a soil test and getting an idea of what's short or long in terms of your nutrients, organic matter content, etc. But my goal is to turn the situation, whatever the problem is, it's seldom that you get all of a sudden the perfect soil. Ah. I have now a gar place to garden with the perfect soil. It's, uh, what is the perfect soil? If I had, this is what Bill Mollison said. He said, the, per the best permaculture site are the ones that have the most diversity of habitats. So they have clay areas, sandy areas, rocky areas, you know, high, low, you know, high, different heights in the landscape, high, medium slope, low, different degrees of, of plant cover, uh, alkaline soils, acid soils, peat, so, you know, peat soils, rocky cliffs, uh, and, 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 you know, stream sides and, and ponds and, or lakes or waterways. If you had to have all that, on, you know, the more of those yeah. you have on one place, the better. In other words, if you, but in my ideal world where, you know, it's like my perfect little garden plot there, I'd like it to be rich, deep topsoil with a high organic matter content, let's say, you know, six to eight percent, something in there. And uh, it's not, it doesn't have a plow pan barrier for roots for a long ways down. The roots can go like, oh, be nice, it's, you know, 20, 50 feet <laughs> of deep <laughs> soil that they can just penetrate. And it would be uh, around 7.0 pH or a little less. And then you could take some parts of it and add acid stuff and take other parts and add alkaline stuff and so you could adjust the pH in different places if you didn't have it. Most soils, most people end up with a place with like a couple of different kinds of soils and not all of them may be good and none of them may be good. That happen, you know, certainly happens to me. None of them are like, oh, you know, it's just like, okay, how do you turn it around? So generally speaking, what I do is put in manure the first year, you know, in, in an ideal situation, it had been tilled the year before you know, do a fall till and a cover crop, and then in the spring you till in that, that cover crop, wait uh, about a month, and then till again so that the cover crop breaks down and whatever weeds were in there, whatever, because there's, you know, most cases you're going to end up with a lot of bunch of weeds of more or less in the mix. Till all that up and wait a month, till it again, and in those initial, right before the initial tillage and the second tillage is when you add all your nutrients. And I like to do it at that first tillage. A lot, you know, munches it, lots of manure. I guess you, you, it's hard to have too much. Uh, you know, I've had situations where I was worried that it was too much, but it was just fine. <laughs> We're fine, I've never added too much manure. Uh, I, my favorite manure is uh, aged cow, you know, or aged goat, or, a, or rabbit. You know, those are wonderful too, but age, you know, big amounts of, you know, any anyway, lots of cow poop or other manures. And I put in a, a wide variety of minerals. Uh, and I, I sort of have the shotgun approach. Well, we'll just make sure and we'll just put everything in there just to make sure it's all there and available. <laughs> it's kind of a silly way of looking at it as a permaculturist. But basically, I put in always kelp meal. I you buy 50. Two, one or two 50 pound bags a year of kelp meal. I buy kelp concentrate, a liquid concentrate, uh, soluble kelp. And I buy, uh, that's getting into micronutrients now. So I put in gypsum usually on, on where your soil's too, uh, too acid. It's generally you put on gypsum. Some places put on limestone or dolomite, but gypsum to me, opens up hard ground, I put it in when the ground's kind of hard, but it's just, it's a source of calcium. Um, I put in a humate, a rock humate, which could be Planters II or Leonardite. Uh, there's other brands, but what you're looking for is rock humates, round up really fine. And I put, I'll, you, know, you don't need huge amounts of that. I maybe I'll, you know, for my little quarter acre this year, maybe I put in Two bags, two 50 pound bags that you make. Maybe four bags of gypsum. Uh, 
um, a couple of bags of CalMag, you know, potassium, magnesium, mineral to again get you get an organic certification, certified sources. Um, and occasionally I like a bag of green sand in there, just a 50 pound bag of green sand. And Biochar? Uh, I've added biochar in small amounts in some situations, but I generally don't have much. What, what mineral am I missing here? What do you think of? Uh, a mineral? Huh? Right. Is phosphorus one of them? No. Oh yeah, rock phosphate, thank you. Uh, always rock phosphate, and that would be like, depending on the site, if you, know, if you knew it was really short, then you'd add more, but generally speaking, maybe two bags of rock phosphate. It's kind of spendy. Some of these things are cheap. Gypsum's cheap. Kelp meal's expensive. You know, so there's a lot of prices here. And then besides that, now I'm, that's what I broad scale out there, in general, what I like to do. But when I plant the actual plants, which I do a lot of things from pots or, or prop root division propagations or trees or shrubs, bare root. So I'm not planting a seed. And then I plant very few of my plantings from seed. It's almost all, it used to be almost all, woody plant stock, bare root woody plants, and herb propagation and division. But last year we did it, we put, we plant, transplant, potted up 4,000 transplants of greenhouse herbs, and 1,000 died, and we got 3,000 plants. But at any rate, so when I plant each of those plants, be it a seedling or whatever, I have a five gallon bucket of my special mix. It's a mix of everything I've mentioned, plus, uh, I like to use a high nitrogen source, and what I, this is so uncultural, but it's, you got you know, it's sort of like fessing up at confessional if you're <laughs> <laughs> I confess, I use fish meal as a nitrogen source because a bag of fish meal is relatively affordable. It's a long distance. I'm closer to the coast than you are. I can get it from, you know, but at any rate, it's, you know, a byproduct of fishing, so it's a sign of, you know, that's ecosystem stripping out is that, there. Is that um, ground up fish? Ground up, yeah, dry ground up fish. Okay. You know, it's a byproduct. I do, uh, and so I've used other things. There are, uh, I buy a balanced fertilizers, a very, you know, mixed fertilizers of high quality and expensive. But anyway, I have, I have my mix of stuff here, and it could have a little biochar in it. We did, we did that with one of my plantings recently. We did, we had a, a buckets of biochar and we put that in each hole too. So I put a, I put a little bit of that stuff, just like a, a half of a, or a third of a, of a, a fourth of a large yogurt container, or a, half, you know, a third of a cottage cheese kind of container. Sometimes I have a little, I have a little scoop and each plant gets a little dose of that right at its root zone so that when it starts growing, it starts taking off and you're watering it and all that stuff is percolating around down there, that plant, boom! finds that stuff and says, okay, I got what I need to go and really rock it. Because I want those plants to take off and I want them to do really well. I don't want, and if you, if you, you could, you could say, well, I don't have enough money and so I'll just, I just won't fertilize much and it'll be okay. And if, and if it's short, then you end up with spindly plants. You don't make much money or they die. And so you haven't really gained any ground there. It's worth to put some money into it to give each, make sure that each one's going to get something really yummy. Unless, of course, you broadcast so well and that you don't need to do it you just don't. but it's hard to it takes a lot of money to broadcast feed a whole big area but if i spot plant that with stuff man that's a lot that's a lot uh, more bang for the buck because you're, you're putting it right where you want it do you use hugel culture oh i use here i we have a new uh you can go to youtube Hugo Coulter Byrne Pilarski, and there's a YouTube of my, this year's is fabulous. Wait, I haven't done the sequel yet, but when we put, this was early on when we were doing a complete sheet mulching with, uh, with bark and uh, wood, and sh wood chips, and it was fabulous. And now it is just like over the top. It's just one of the, I don't know, people, I get lots of compliments. It really is a phenomenal first year garden on a fresh Hugo Coulter made this spring. And man, it knocks your socks off. And you're still using your special mix there. I hardly did. I did a little bit of that, but not so much. Okay. And we didn't. And the Hugo culture, when it went, when we put it in there, you had some biochar. We're talking like a couple trailer loads of not truck trailers, but small trailer loads of biochar. And we had some 
you know, you know, a dump truck load of manure. But I tell you what, this is Hugo culture is like stretches from here all the way down to the end of the block and then part way down the other side. Wow. And it's seven, it's like 10 feet tall, you know, six to 10 feet tall, gigantic terraces out of fresh cedar and, and a lot of other conifer foliage and trunks and stumps and just <laughs> mostly conifer material just pound it into shape and throw a bunch of dirt on top and you'd say, and it and was super sandy, very relatively infertile soil that was dumped on top of it. Oh, wow. We had a little bit of fertilizer to put in there, but we're going like, oh, this is, you can see this is a very good soil. And we have to cram the roots of these things to get them in between the, you know, the wood, there's woody down, material yeah. down there. So it was a little bit difficult getting things in, not, not unduly, we got it in. And things have just skyrocketed. I've never seen such big specimens of many of these things. And they've given, given them decent watering, but they didn't need water till May something. They uh, uh, were having phenomenal growth, and the only thing I can credit it to is that there's so much juice from all that breaking matter down there, and gases rising, because all that is creating gases that rise, because their roots may not be down there very far yet, but, but they're, they're, you can bet I know those little plant roots are probably that far down into the pile, but there's not much resistance. Yeah. There's a lot of open pore space, so they're just zooming down there and having a great time extracting the nutrients that are there. And so they're not showing any nutrient stress. Out There are a few species, um, but not many. By and large, I'm super what impressed with it. Do you think it's the fungal yeah. for, with the wood supporting the fungal growth? There obviously is fungal growth in there. But a lot of the stuff is like brand new, just you know, cedar foliage. And they say, oh, you don't use cedar in yeah. cedar cultures. But you know, it's working great. What are, what are you growing? Yeah. Oh, uh, all the medicinal herbs and uh, berries, you know, the, all the usual berries. Uh, tr some tree crops, mainly we're trying to keep, we don't want too dense as seen, we want it mostly sunny. All the perennial medicinal herbs, tons of annuals, calendulas, beans, and cabbages, and you know, squash, and you know, so there's a, it's like a vegetable garden combined with a medicinal herb crop combined with a berry garden. We have we aligned all the pathways with strawberries, and they're just, you know, next year there's going to be this immense strawberry harvest. You know, <laughs> it's just, it's just, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the best. It's, I, I'm, a, I'm amazed myself. I'm like, wow. How long did it take? Oh well, the video was taken. We started planning in April, and I think the videos from like maybe May, and it was looked good, you know. And so we, you know, we started planning I think in April, like early, maybe early April. Well, this is over on the east, on the west side of the Cascades. Yeah. Michael, yeah. I think of myself as a beginning gardener, even though I've been the manager of a community garden for probably four or five years. But then I left for two years to go to college. But, um, so I was in Olympia, going to Evergreen College, and there's a, uh, a group called Grub. Grub, which yeah. Which is um, urban farming. So they come and build um, raised gardens for you. Well, so they did that to my nephew and built him three of these. That was good. But I thought, well, I want more than just one little thing. So I, so on my own, I just, and I'm not very strong, so I just got, I went and got lots of cardboard. Because I thought, I can't dig through some of this ground. Because so, it's just long. So I went and got cardboard and just laid out what I thought was a rectangle of a garden spot that I wanted. And I did that like four times, so I would have four plots. And then I just went to a farmer and got um, aged horse manure. And I just got a truck load of it for free. And then I just put probably that much a foot. I was thinking in my head, then at least a foot. <laughs> so all I did was just stack it there and then I just put plants in it. And my garden was really pretty phenomenal. When I think of myself, it's like, oh, I don't do that good. But that year, when I did it the most simple, it seemed like I got the most. Wow, you know? okay, and well, I that's quite the example there. It's a form of sheet mulching. Yeah. But planting yeah. directly in, 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 yeah. in compost and horse manure is a new thought. And then when I looked underneath the next uh, spring, 
there's a massive amount of worms. Yeah, it's not, yeah, they're, they're, they're so the prep for the, yeah, the second year is just awesome. But you got a good prop the first year too. That's good. Yeah. Pretty good. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, Let me. See. I want to back up on one one step here, and, and also look at our time. We must be getting like we have 15 minutes left now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I see you have your hand up, but I just want to back up a little bit because I talked about all these things I add into the system to make really healthy, you know, really yummy soil for my plants. Permaculture wise, I should be scolded and said, why didn't you find local sources? of all that stuff instead of importing stuff in, you know, in bags from somewhere else. We, as a per young permaculturist, we used to make fun of organic farmers and poke fun at them and say, ha, 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 all they do is they just get a different kind of bag. And I'm like, well, here I am in the same boat going, oh yeah, I'm just, you know, buying bags of stuff from, you know, you know questionable sources in some <laughs> cases. We, you, some of these things are hard to, access locally, but we, as a permaculture crowd in northwest Montana, we really should, what are all the closest sources of mineral fertilizers produced in our region that we can get? It should be something that we should do for our own peace of mind. Uh, what are the best sources of phosphate besides imported rock phosphate? By the way, there are rock phosphate mines in Montana. What are the what are what are the analogs or the substitutes for all the things I'm buying in bags? You know, kelp. Could we have? Can the algae aqua plant uh, produce the same kind of nutrient mix as a kelp? Uh, a seaweed product? Probably not exactly, but I bet there's maybe some analog there. So, huh, what are our analogs for all the, the things I'm buying in bags? Because if the system goes to hell in a hand basket, a lot of those bags ain't gonna be showing up at the local depot for me to pick up. And so I better be ready for that. So there's a, so a, a good permaculturist, you know, pointing fingers at myself, would, would really look at what are the, so, the local sources of the fertilizer and how can I do it best locally that I have a secure, secure source even if there's outside societal disruption. You know, instead of getting yourself all addicted like I am to these certain things. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so that's the more permaculture approach. So, so what I'm, is your source? Huh? What would your source be? I, I don't know. I haven't done the research. There's and so a, I need to do, team well, up with my local people to find out. There's a new plant in Shelby, Montana, not far from my grandparents' old farm. My parents are now living there. I drove by it the other day, and I, I looked over at it and it said, Organic Humates, and it's some company name. Looked it up on the internet, and they take it all to Florida and distribute it out of Florida. All oh, the organic you make comes from Florida. Uh, they make it. But that's, that's how the system works. That's how works. globalization yeah. works. Because like with lumber, we had Plum Creek and you know, Kalispell area in Columbia Falls, and all that lumber would go out of the valley, mm -hmm. and then the lumber yards would be hauling lumber in yeah. from Oregon or from, I mean. <laughs> in the last <laughs> workshop I took was with Jessica, and she said that she would uh, follow around arborists to get their trees, like to make them into wood chips, and then yeah. to go down here at Wolfwood Creek or River and get fungus. <laughs> Over it, so and then we planted our corn, squash, and beans, and they're great. Okay, oh, let me back up and again. So that probably isn't right, but in that situation, our, it it's is. great. I mean, yeah, our, our corn is huge, and yeah. our llamas are oh, utilized. Oh, yeah, well, that's that's mm -hmm. using the, all the animal products for sure. In my defense, <laughs> uh, I would say that I also, and I forgot a big input like my big planting last year, I bought a 50 yard load of uh, hog fuel, which is half bark and half wood chips. And I spread that over my area, you know, over my area, you know, it's generally about that kind of thickness, mm -hmm. thick over the whole patch. 
and it really inhibited the weeds and it mm -hmm. fed this whole soil web of light. There's a huge amount of mycelination. It's just like one big network, a fungal network underground. And everything's growing great. And that's my, that's my, a big part of my input is that I really do like using chips on my system. It's another outside input, but, um, but uh, you could generate as much as possible from on site. But the other thing, uh, one more before I forget, is that that's that first year is usually the only time I fertilize my whole system. Mm -hmm. I'm fertilizing for 20 years, and some places I've got I've, well, I have systems going that have been really that are 20 years old, and I don't think there's been the fertilizer input is in the first year to get so many minerals in there that they're then going to just cycle through the system. You're exporting a bit as you go, but there's a lot more inputs. You know, there's when you have a really good system input come to your system. If you have, a, I have my, I was talking to my, the farmer that inherited my, one of my abandoned uh, herb farms and he said, the place is a bird sanctuary. And I did a little shooting there with a little video. And during the whole video, it's just like the place, it's just like alive with bird song. There's all these birds that nest there mm -hmm. and take cover there, the quails, the pheasants, and the, the red-winged blackbirds. Anyway, it's just there's a huge amount of bird life there. And they are raining nutrients into the system with their poop. So we, when you create the habitat, all of a sudden the nutrients flow to you. And when the winds blow across the neighbor's fields and it hits all the, my windbreak system with all these trees and shrubs, it drops the dust and leaves and debris, you know, things drop out of the air and there's insect bodies and there's you know, all this web of life happening. And that just creates a huge amount of nutrients are being transformed out of sun and biology and so that that first additional expensive input of minerals and uh, good stuff is enabling a, a, a you know a long very long-term payback and so in my defense that's that's uh, you know if you had to do that every year I would say tisk 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 but I'm doing it to kickstart the system so it hurts oh boy <laughs> so I just put my garden needs an overhaul and I need to till and some organic matter, but I do have a few perennials that are doing okay. So do you leave them there and work around them? Do you dig them up and replant them? No, what leave them do? there. I would say almost almost always, unless it's really in the wrong place and you just got to have a path there or something. Generally, I almost always, always leave those things and plant around them. Sheet mulch systems, high biomass systems, lots of mulch, you know, they maybe make it if you're trying to like rotor kill or something. It might make it a little difficult, but uh, keep them in place and maybe use them as basis points for a, depending on what they are for gills. Like this is going to be this big, and maybe we can have it ringed with uh, some shrubs that are about this big that are around the edge of it, so it becomes a full you know, There's a, a, a plant community that you sort of put together there for it. We have a community garden that we started about three years ago, and every year we go through in the spring and trim all the shrubs. It's an apartment complex, and so we trim all the shrubs in the apartment complex and then just sheet mulch the section of the lawn and put hugels. And if I go at 6.30 in the morning, I found out down to the city's yard, they, they suck up all the leaves off the street trees, and then they compost them for three years in Kalispell. And then you can get the compost for free and they'll load you. Wow. And they Tree also have compost. wood chips. I just found out that they have wood chips. Wow. Um, for free? Like, yeah, for free. So you and have to get up at 6. You have to get there at 6.30 to get them loaded for free. Yeah. <laughs> hey, but it's worth it. You know? deal. So I bring my trailer down there and they load it up. And then I'm doing the same thing where you just I sheet mulch the whole thing and then put the wood chips in the path as deep as possible and then they trench down and then I got to replenish them. But they do really help with the weeds and then try to be as aggressive as possible at getting any weeds that do come in. And the one thing I wish I had done differently that I'm going to go back and do I think is where we put the fence around the perimeter, digging down on the outside of the fence and putting in some kind of a barrier. Because so we don't have that root so the roots, coming Yeah, because the, the roots just keep coming in you know? and I, from the grass outside. Cause we went right on top of the lawn like this, and and it's just. Yeah. Yeah. I got a 
you slide cardboard underneath your fence if you've got like this much room, couple sheets of cardboard under the fence and then cover it with chips or whatever. Oh, like on the other side? Yeah. Well, but on the, so you got, you got your fence here and you got your grass yeah. on this side and your garden on this side. You so slide you some cardboard it. so it's going on either side of the fence essentially. Right. Right. And then cover it with chip. Instead of stopping at the Instead fence. Instead of stopping at the fence line, yeah. If you can get it, under, depending on what type of fence you have, if you can get right. it under that fence barrier right. and have it, yeah, not be a gap. So I want to say something about manure because <coughs> obviously some people have more experience with it oh, than others. I can't but what I know right. about it is that it has to be aged. And there are certain recommendations, that, especially for farmers, about that aging process. I don't remember the number of months and years for each type of manure, but it has to be aged so that the bacteria in it doesn't contaminate your food, and also so that it's not too hot. Because we put um, horse manure in my herbal garden bed when we were first establishing that bed, and the herbs were real spindly, and they looked like they had been on fire. <laughs> so it took a couple of years by adding more uh, compost and mulch uh, for those plants to get healthy mm -hmm. and for the herb garden to do well because that manure, wherever it came from, probably wasn't aged in, to the right, right extent. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a, you may have had this, maybe your problem, I don't know. There's something called chlorpyrrolid. Uh, it's a herbicide used on hay crops, oh, yeah. straw crops, and, and so if, if and if you that straw or that hay will poison your ground for two or three years, it, some things worse than others. I had a, I, I had it happen to a friend, uh, and even using the manure from an animal that's been fed yeah. for pyrrolid laced hay, that manure that will be toxic to, so to, to the garden you know, plant. So that's that? that's one worrisome thing about manures and especially yeah. straws uh, but you know you you know straw and hay and manure should you know have to be unfortunately regarded with suspicion and make sure that there's no for purulent herbicide used on the, but the, the fact that they can be too hot is really true that's particularly often the case for chicken mm. pig uh, certainly human waste uh, that really does require that long-term careful composting. I said I like prefer aged cow manure. One year, half a year even is fine with me. Uh, horse is really a cold manure, and so they're usually loaded with weed seeds. I'm, so I I'm, I'm generally don't like to use horse manure, but if it's what I can get, you can take it with the load of weed seeds and you just have to really, no matter what, I don't know of a gardener anywhere that doesn't have to worry about garden weed seeds, that, that doesn't have a weed seed component to the soil. The best gardeners get to a place where there are no weed seeds left. But you know what? Those are damn rare. No weed seeds left. You've bought them for so many years and outwitted them every minute of their all the time. Man, that's tough. So anyway, there, the... Uh, where was I at? Manure. Manure. Oh, that being cold. So that, that I'll so I'll take I'll take cold forest manure that's not composted and that's gonna have a lot of seed mix in it if there's really not much else I can get. But I have to be aware that I'm chancing bringing in all kinds of different weeds that I didn't have before. That's possible with any manure, but especially with horse. Rabbit is one of the most benign manures you could possibly use. Goat is very benign, benign. and so is llama. I would say that you could use that stuff fresh oh, yeah. by benign. I mean, I think I could. You could use that stuff fresh if you wanted. Aged is always better, but that's the kind of manures you can use fresh. Cow, I really think we should age. Uh, I don't. I'm not a fan of fresh cow manure. The market gardens of Paris before the automobile had fleets of horses pulling all the wagons and everything around town and all the buggies and all the delivery things. And there were people that went out there scooping the streets. And so there was a lot of truckloads or wagon loads of manure being hauled off of Paris to the market gardens on the in the on the outskirts of Paris where they piled that stuff that, you know, up to a foot deep of, of, of uh, fresh horse manure 
and grew these fantastic, famous Parisian market gardens. I mean, they were using fresh horse manure, and man, they knocked the socks off. Yeah, they were dynamite gardeners. I mean, they produced they, phenomenal production, uh, produce amounts. So it can be, you know, so the idea that manure is unsafe is is uh, the FDA or the USDA is sort of making um, uh, making a bigger deal out of it than it actually is in a way, in the sense of saying, oh, it's so dangerous, well, you have to be careful, you farmers. Pretty soon, you won't be able to touch manure with a 10-foot pole, and you have to have your thermometer there just right. And if you didn't keep your thermometer record right, well, then that stuff is not you know, it's bad, and you're bad. And it's the, the crackdown on manure in agriculture, I feel, is very unfortunate. Uh, there is some. There are, you know, feedlot cattle yeah. and feedlot pigs yeah. and stuff. That that yeah. stuff is vile, polluted, you know, and and hazardous it. waste. That's it needs to be really processed. Too just much right. of anything. It's all too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. <laughs> right. Well, that's really. You know, we're they're feeding them a really mm -hmm. bad and chemical laced diet. A lot of antibiotics and stuff. You're getting a lot of bi GMO stuff. You're getting a lot of nasty byproducts in that poop stream. We should ban though when. President, permaculture presidential platform. <laughs> Should we ban large ban feedlots and no and more climate facilities? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, no so. more CAFOs. <laughs> yeah, okay, no CAFOs. What about, what about manure teas? <laughs> manure tea is an awesome stuff to use, and also as well as fermented herbal tea. Um, manure teas, but nettle tea and thistle tree and comfrey tea, oh. yarrow, chamomile, mm. oak bark. Uh, so you just put yarrow. Those are I would I would use those are the biodynamic plants. You notice that uh, most of those are biodynamic plants that the biodynamic people have sniffed out. That ooh, that stuff is good for the garden. Let's get some essence of yarrow so in there. You just stuff them in a sock or something and drop it in. No, you stuff it right into the barrel. Just let it, it ferment the and then dilute it one to ten and spread it on the garden. Mm -hmm. And it's like a big kick in the butt uh, fertility and cosmic elements and special nutrients, bioavailable, this and that. I mean, this stuff is like, not your socks off. Herbal medicine for your plants. We went to a winery in Northern California that was doing that with their vineyards. They were putting different herbal teas underneath different um, vines to give those vines a certain flavor and uh -huh. energy. I'm making as a metal company. Um, and now there's mosquito larvae in it. Ah, well you don't want that. Well, you obviously let it too sit. So let it, you know, usually it's ten days to two weeks, and you're and you're you're done, and you're spreading it out. The mosquito larvae is, aren't going to develop in a short-term thing like that. They possibly might hatch, but you're you know you're right on it. So, how long you're talking longer term? Right? Well, it's been sitting for yeah. So that was pretty fast. So, there, so there's maybe a point there. It might be the Martin mosquito larvae really adding to the nutrient content, though, <laughs> yeah. and it might be just like really better. <laughs> but the thing is, you don't want them to, for, to complete their life cycle and fly off to fight you. <laughs> so you know, two, ten days, two weeks for the most of the uh, herbal teas for the garden. And yeah, my, and you were uh, that stuff is full of life forms, and one of them happened to be that. I would think though that you may not have had enough material in there because it should be pretty thick. It yeah. should be like water with a bit of stuff floating around. It no, should be like mostly material with with under the surface. Yeah, and I I've and added water because it's been so hot that it's like evaporated. evaporated so. a bunch, so. Well, it sounds like it's ready to go. Yeah, I need to use it. It's yeah. pretty dark. So. Yeah, yeah. It starts smelling bad sometimes. When it really gets kind of gross, you say, "Well, I better just spread it before it gets worse." <laughs> so, could you tell me what the biodynamic plants are again? Nettle, chamomile, yarrow, uh, um, white white oak. Comfrey, I think I'm not sure. Yeah, probably almost. Yeah. Probably Back almost. 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 Well, you could use any plant material. She's just asking, oh, and valerian flowers and dandelion. What other biodynamic right. prep? Okay. Those biodynamic plants. Those are the ones I can remember. Using white oak? White oak bark. Oak. 
Oh, oh, oh. OAK. I'm not sure, but I know it works really good. The, the, the list of good plants to make compost tea is not just the biodynamic ones, but I always think something special about them. So I like the idea of using a biodynamic plant. So with the dandelion, do you use the root or the leaf? It's a flower. Oh, the flower. The flower of the dandelion is used. So that's what I do with all those dandelion flowers. It makes, yeah. you yeah. tell you what though, the, root, the payback is highest too. in dandelion wine. Yeah. <laughs> you could sell it as dandelion or fritters, dandelion oh, dried flowers, but dandelion <laughs> wine is the <laughs> highest value added product. I, I, well, one of the higher ones. I made all right. Go back to, until 50 years ago, people cultivated dandelions oh, regularly, and they actually had prized strains mm -hmm. of them. And Down it was, at the county fair, they'd have, you'd have big specimens. And they, <laughs> uh, I just read a whole article about it. It was after World War II that that all changed, mm -hmm. and the whole lawn product business began, and the whole uh, food business began, because there weren't grocery stores. And, like, I have this real long-leafed, real wide-leafed dandelion, and someone explained, well, that's an Italian variety. That's one that's really <laughs> dandelion prized. Dandelion supposedly, that's, yeah, it's the largest cultivated plant on the planet. It grows I eat everywhere. It, I eat it, the it's whole the thing, thing all year round. Crowns and peas. I don't know if you all know about the dandelion peas in the early spring before they're all opening. They make their flower, unopened flower buds are about the size of peas, yeah. and you can pick them, bowls of them, and put them in the refrigerator and they last for weeks. And you can pickle them, kind of like make a caper substitute. Oh, a caper substitute, right. And but you can you put can them in your potato soup, you put them, you steam them, you add them on the rice. It's little bits of yellow, but they last for weeks. But then once the dandelions have gone to puffballs, like you make fritters in the spring, but only until they've gone to puffballs, the first seed heads, and then they start getting bitter and you don't, the peas are dry. and. It's, a, it's just a few weeks season, but I pick like gallons of them and then I just put them in everything for a few weeks because it's just an early spring and then I eat the crowns too. The, uh, so Larry Evans taught me that he, was, he brought out this kimchi he makes from the crowns. Not the roots, not the leaves, but the crown in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it makes delicious. A dynamite kimchi. So I'm just like, wow, not dandelion. I don't know that guy, but I can speak yeah. about the kimchi being the lower. The yellow, the strawberry, or the leaves. Yeah, that's how I put the leaves. What do you mean? That's how I put leaves. So I make sure there's lots of dandelions in my garden and I let them go to seed because I want more. I want dandelion as part of my garden. And I'll say to people, my weeders, I'll say, should I take this dandelion out? No, it's not bothering anything. This one here is right tied up next to a smaller plant. I want a favor off of the bed. I want lots of dandelion in my system for the money and also for the ecological effect of the mineral the mine. Oh, it's like a parsnip. The roots are like, to me, they taste like parsnips if you, uh, in the spring, harvest them and like a, maybe a potato soup or something like that, add them to them and uh, they're very sweet and I slice them and dry them and then I have a coffee grinder that I only use for herbs and so I'll grind them and the slicing them thin thinner works better they dry faster on brown paper and then uh, then I put them in the coffee grinder and I put it in my smoothie you don't even notice it then so I'm like sometimes doing an ounce a day you know of, of dandelion root which is a you know a good little amount wow. but how are you going to eat an ounce a day <laughs> unless you put in a smoothie and then maybe there's a little ta you know fiber but you don't notice it but you also putting it in your soup in your those early spring soups they're delicious yeah. sweet okay. those bigger dandelions the roots are bigger well I, I um, I'm having a garden tour in the morning and I live on the other side of town and and our dirt's 50% rock here and I had a bulldozer come in and uh, dig all the dirt out and then I did a kind of hugel pits where I've got the branches in the bottom because we're a desert climate here. Yeah. And so I'm capturing water when we have it. My pits are four feet deep. Uh -huh. The logs are in the bottom. I had 18 yards of manure br brought in, which is several dump truck loads and a couple dump truck loads of sand. And then I had an ad in the paper. And so people brought me their leaves and their mm -hmm. everything. And I put the, 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 the uh, weeds in my compost. And then I used the leaves to mulch and different things. But uh, um, so I don't have rocks. So my dandelions are coming out uh, thick. So you they come out easier too. Well, I use a potato fork. That's my cultivating 
weeder of choice because I could be on my knees, my dirt's soft enough, or on my standing up, but you, you dig with a potato fork and then you've got the whole root. You're not trying with that skinny little thing and bless the girl's heart over here, she was wrestling with it. Of course the ground's hard, but the potato fork, it pulls the whole thing up, it cultivates, shake the dirt off and then I get these roots that are this long and they're this big around when they're coming out. Sometimes they're big forked things. And yeah. All right, so I, I just, I to wonder, we're going to end this, the, but I do want to point out that Nina's garden has always really impressed me and I've seen a lot of permaculture gardens and you know there's just a lot of biomass there. I, I always say that she could capitalize a lot more productivity out of it but she has got one of the best uh, no. substrates, you know, systems, you know, established, you know, And I'm not system. focusing on my annuals. I'm really focusing right now on creating, uh, making dirt and uh, getting my perennials in, my food forest. And I haven't um, seen it in a couple of years, so I'm sure it's It's pretty correct. dry right now. I had two people show up on Friday morning, and I realized that to, you know, it just looks very brown and very dry. We've had a lot of grasshoppers and we had over 100 degrees for about three weeks. And I had, I only planted five tomatoes. I didn't plant much because I'm focused on other things. But um, most of the classes I wanted to come to are today. And I put uh, on the other places, I put a, uh, it says a, a local garden tour, food not, food not lawns and is my description and there's a triangle on the map where my house is it's oh, about okay. five blocks but I'm gonna do two tours tomorrow during the classes so okay. anybody that wants to come okay here's here's our ending song <laughs> and yo know, you've all heard the tune love and Mary love and Mary go together like a horse and carry okay, we didn't change that yeah. herbs and permaculture herbs and permaculture Go together like a horse and carriage. Herbal medicine, permaculture. <laughs> I know. Well, that was one of the hardest, one of the more. Yeah, I, I, I know. I, I will. Uh, but anyway, we have a lot of. That was an off the cuff. Manure. <laughs> Permaculture. Yeah, we just need a few word changes, yeah. but it's, it's catchy. <laughs> herbs and permaculture, herbs and permaculture. Now that he's dancing like that, it's pretty cute. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Somebody will do the hardware to use the It is. Yeah, well, I had to work. I got a few, but it is <laughs> difficult. Okay, well, thank you all for coming and talking about herbs and sharing. Thank you. Thank you.